Alright, hello all, and welcome back to Introverse Uncharted, the show that aims to remove the gravity from your world and send you on a journey through the stars. My name is John, and I'll be your guide into the Introverse today. Um, if you're tuned in today, it's Wednesday, it's hump day, you've made it halfway through the week, which, trust me, I know is no small feat a lot of times. So congratulations, I'm glad that you guys are uh, all with me today and doing good, and uh, I can't wait to get into all the stuff we're going to talk about today. Um, but as always, before we get started, let's just uh, knock some housekeeping out of the way, all right? Let's do that. Just a few reminders. Number one, uh, this is an amateur podcast, obviously. Uh, you may hear some background noise, like I always tell you. I got my kid in the next room uh, chilling with me today. Uh, I got my dogs as an office fan. My desk chair may squeak, because if you've ever seen me on TikTok, I have this uh, issue going back and forth. Like, I'll swing my chair back and forth the whole time, so... You may hear that. Whatever, it may happen. Uh, I apologize in advance, but uh, very little I can do to kind of uh, avoid all of those things. Um, I just want to remind you of where you can find me and other related uh, info and stuff like that to this podcast on social media. I've been doing a ton of TikToks lately, guys, so check me out on TikTok at introverse underscore uncharted. Um, I always post on Instagram when I'm going to put out new episodes and stuff like that. So go check me out on Instagram at introverse underscore uncharted 13. And uh, you can find me on Facebook. I have a Facebook page for introverse uncharted that is just at introverse uncharted. So go ahead and head on over to all these kinds of social media pages, see what's going on. And uh, it'll keep you updated on uh, what I'm doing and when the show is going to be out and uh, stuff like this week when uh, we were waiting for starship, I did a bunch of stuff on, uh, on TikTok getting ready for starship. So, uh, remember, go over to those places, like, share, follow, subscribe. Uh, if you like this video, if you like all the other videos, if you like my uh, TikTok stuff, like, follow, share, subscribe, all that stuff. And honestly, feel free, guys, to let me know in the comments on anything, you know, over at TikTok right here. Um, if there are any topics you'd like me to talk about, space-related, sports-related, stuff like that, I don't know everything. But I'm totally down to do some research and uh, and come to you with my opinions uh, if that's what you guys are looking for. Um, let's try to take this show, you know, beyond just these radio waves. Let's take it to the moon. Let's take it to Mars. Let's take it beyond. Let's do all that stuff, guys. All right, we're going to hit the rundown for the day. On Monday, SpaceX attempted their first orbital test flight for Starship. Um, all went pretty good for most part. Um... Down at about the T minus 15 minute mark, SpaceX detected a, a pressure related anomaly. Um, however, they chose to keep the countdown clock going, uh, saying that if, uh, if they couldn't resolve the issue, the flight would essentially scrub and it would become a, a quote, wet dress rehearsal, um, which is essentially where they just practice fueling and then detanking the vehicle. Um, at, at about T minus eight minutes, they did officially scrub for the day, citing that there was a frozen pressure valve. Um, as the reason for termination of the launch. Uh, but they did proceed all the way to the T minus 10 second mark to do the, the wet dress rehearsal, and then they began detanking. Um, SpaceX said that the next attempt would have to be a minimum of 48 hours out. However, as of Tuesday, it was announced that they would target Thursday, April 20th, so tomorrow, for their next attempt. Uh, the irony to me on that is that Elon has been joking for a hot minute about uh, trying to launch on 420, so... Uh, cheers, Elon. Now you uh, you get your wish on this one. And uh, I don't know that he truly needs a reason to get high and watch his rocket launch. But, uh, I mean, what a way to celebrate 420 for him. So, uh, again, cheers, Elon. I hope, uh, hope you have a good time. And uh, to anybody who's actually going to watch, I know the flight window, I'm pretty sure, will still open really early. I got up at uh, 5.45 in the morning just before the flight window on Monday just for the uh, for the scrub so jokes on me I guess on that but uh if you're gonna be up and around I'll be uh, doing some TikTok stuff that day getting ready to watch the launch and hopefully this time we get to see Starship launch it's gonna be really cool um hopefully we finally get there it's been a long time coming um I know there's a lot of people pumped and check out the live coverage of uh of NASA space flight I watch them on on YouTube as well uh, they're not paying me. This isn't a plug for them. I just really enjoy watching them. They're, they have a lot of knowledge that they drop. Um, they answer a lot of questions about how the flight's going to go and all the technology. 
and all that kind of stuff. So again, not a plug, just a genuinely happy uh, viewer on their product. So nasaspaceflight.com. You can find them on YouTube. That's where I watch all of my launch stuff from, guys. So go ahead and check them out if you get a free second. All right. So because this week was supposed to be the first launch of Starship, or at least earlier in the week, now we still have another shot tomorrow. But in honor of the first orbital test flight of Starship today, I just want to talk a little bit to you guys about Starship and what Starship is and what the end goals of the Starship mission are, okay? Now, Starship is... The whole vest vehicle is also called Starship, but Starship mainly, if you look up Starship is the top capsule portion of the rocket, essentially. Okay, so it's where the cargo and the crew essentially can be held. But the whole vehicle is called Starship, just as a shortened term for it. But Starship is made up of the Starship, the, the physical crew capsule up at the top, as well as SpaceX's super heavy booster, which is essentially the first stage. There are two stages to the flight here, okay? Combined... They're 120 meters tall, 9 meters wide. They're huge. Um, it's going to be the biggest rocket that we've ever launched. It's going to be incredible. It's going to be impressive. Starship alone has 1,500 pounds of thrust force. Combined with the Super Heavy Booster, the Super Heavy Booster also has 7,590 thrust force units. So it's going to be fast. It's going to be powerful. Okay. The propellant capacity on both is, is amazing as well. Just on Starship alone, it's uh, about 1,200 tons of propellant capacity. And then on the Super Heavy Booster, it is 3,400 tons. It's a lot. There's a lot of fuel. Uh, they use uh, liquid nitrogen and liquid oxygen to, to launch. So lots of fuel, lots of explosive power. This thing is going to rocket us literally into space and beyond it's it's, it's going to be incredible the power that this thing is going to have and at the base of that power are the spacex raptor engines the raptor engines are 10 feet high four feet wide they have a thrust force of about 230 and this vessel is going to have 33 of them the super heavy booster is going to have let's see 13 in the center 22 around the outside so that's a lot. That is a lot of Raptor power right there. The physical Starship, the top portion, the second stage. So once that first stage booster drops off, Starship also has some Raptors. Has three regulars and three Raptor vacuum engines, which are specifically designed to be used in the vacuum of space. There's a lot. There's a lot of power there. And those those rocket boosters, seriously, guys, if you like tune in to the live cast when they're doing it, the boosters look amazing. And when they light up, especially, it's going to look a lot kind of... They're going to look similar to how the launch looks for, like, the Falcons and stuff like that with the Merlin engines. But they're so much bigger and they're so much more powerful. So I think we're going to get some really cool visual out of how this rocket performs when it takes off. Alright. So, I'm going to give you an overview of, of Starship's program a lot of this is going to be quotes that I have found from Elon and from the SpaceX website about what their their premise is for specifically Starship, okay? So I'm going to start you off with a quote. It says, uh, SpaceX's Starship spacecraft and super heavy rocket collectively referred to as Starship represent a fully reusable transportation system designed to carry both crew and cargo to Earth's orbit, to the moon, Mars, and beyond. Starship will be the world's most powerful launch vehicle ever developed, capable of carrying up to 150 metric tons of fully reusable and 250 tons of metric expendable cargo, essentially. So fuel, stuff like that, is all kind of expendable. It all burns off. Reusable is going to be pieces of the capsule. So Starship itself, reusable. It'll, it can land. Uh, the solid rocket booster, it can re-land. The... Uh, the super heavy booster. Sorry, it can reland the first stage. It's going to be, it's going to come back down. It's going to land right on the pad, and they're going to use clamps to catch it. It's going to be really impressive if they can pull it off. Honestly, um, Starship is the first fully reusable spaceship and second stage of the Starship system. The vehicle offers an integrated payload section and is capable of carrying crew, 
to the moon, to the Mars, and beyond. Starship is also capable, and this is my favorite thing, one of my favorite things that they put on their website, okay? Starship is also capable of carrying crew and cargo from point to point transport on Earth, enabling travel to anywhere in the world in one hour or less. So they're talking about building little star bases, if you will, uh, across the world. And then you'd be able to essentially launch this thing into low Earth orbit and travel it very quickly through orbit and drop it onto one of these star bases so that you can essentially whatever you're carrying, crew, cargo, whatever, can drop off, they're saying, in an hour or less. Let's just talk about how how crazy this thought process is real quick. I still get itchy if my Amazon package isn't here the next day, okay? We're talking an hour or less for something to get from one country to another. That's insane. And it would set new precedences for everything. And don't get me wrong. I'm sure that there are negatives to it, okay? I'm sure that we can use that for evil. Uh, plenty of places in the world, ourselves included, have found nifty ways of taking really cool inventions and turning them into weapons and all sorts of nonsense. So let's hope that this doesn't happen to this. But think about how how awesome it would be to get things that much quicker, to streamline a lot faster. I mean, we might not even need it, okay? Like, we already, like I said, I get itchy about Amazon being a touch behind. Let alone now we're raising this bar up to the point where things being delivered in an hour or less that's whew, at least from one place to the other and then it can be shipped on trucks boats planes all sorts of stuff like that but that's a lot <laughs> it's, it's very fast so that would be pretty cool um see spacex says about their super heavy rocket that the super heavy is the first stage or booster of the starship launch system powered by 33 raptor engines using sub-cooled liquid methane and liquid oxygen super heavy is fully reusable and will re-enter earth's atmosphere and land back on the launch site spacex has obviously become famous for launching things exceedingly high and then watching them land on things like boats and barges and all sorts of stuff the uh, the falcon 9 does it fairly often at this point it's a uh, it's pretty routine for them uh, like I said, this this one will be a little different. This one, they're going to launch it, and it's going to come directly back to the launch pad. I'm pretty sure they call it RTLS, Return to Launch Site. And uh, as it comes down, it's going to back burn to slow down. It's going to have a just a it's going to launch a little bit of fuel back out. It's going to burn. It's going to slow it way down, and then as it approaches the pad, it's going to get caught in two very large clamps, and then it's going to sit it down. Now, the premise behind that is, in theory, if they do that, if they sit it back down perfectly with the clamps, the clamps can release and then turn and grab another starship and pick it up and put it back on top, and then they can refuel and launch again. You'd have probably a remarkably fast turnaround. SpaceX is already remarkably fast. I've seen two launches in less than five hours, kind of thing. Like, they, they move fast. They like having the big turnaround. They like being productive and moving in a forward direction. Um, I think they could do a lot of cool things, like I said, with this specific thought process. And if they can do it fast at the velocity and at the, the, the huge nature. I mean, again, think about how big this rocket is. Seriously, guys, if you're not into space, you probably don't know. But, like, seriously, go, go look at a picture of of star of this the ship it is crazy starship is is massive it is bigger if you look up comparisons to things like the space shuttle it is so much bigger and so much more powerful so if you can do that fast if you can do a fast turnaround with a huge rocket just think about how much we could accomplish in space and, and, and honestly, with the point-to-point -point system uh, on Earth, just, just moving consumer goods and stuff like that, um, obviously they're going to use these. I've heard that they're going to use Starship for uh, a lot of the Starlink satellites and stuff like that. Uh, SpaceX is super into the Starlink thing right now. I'm sure it'll work. I'm sure it'll be great. They're launching a lot of Falcon 9s with it. Um, so 
let's see what happens going forward. But like I said, the immense scale, the size of this rocket alone is going to be incredible. And if they can turn and move it fast and fast and fast and make more and more and more launches, it's going to be incredible. Um, this is one of the other cool things that I saw on SpaceX's website. And they're talking about on-orbit refueling systems. So, essentially what that means, I'll actually, I'll use the quote first, okay? So, Starship leverages tanker vehicles. Essentially, the Starship just minus windows, okay? They're going to use those vehicles to refuel Starship in low Earth orbit prior to departing for a farther destination like the Moon or like Mars. Refueling on orbit enables the transport of up to 100 tons all the way to Mars. And if the tanker ship has high reuse capability, the primary cost is just that of the oxygen and methane, which is extremely low. Let's let's just talk about the impact of being able to refuel in space. Because right now, I think a lot of the things that we've always desired to do mission-wise is based on how much fuel you have to carry, how much weight the vehicle is. Um, think about the, uh, the New Horizons mission that went to Pluto, okay? It was the smallest and lightest spacecraft ever. But with that said, it was the fastest because it had nothing to carry. It was just taking pictures and collecting light amounts of data and sending it back. And it was sent hurtling through space with no end destination. So if you go on their website, if you go on NASA's website, you can see that, like... Voyager 1 and 2 and the New Horizons mission, like these have all left the solar system. They're gone. They're way out there, which is cool. If they're still turned on, which I'm fairly certain the last time I checked, some of them are, they're still collecting data outside the reaches of our sun, outside of our gravitational hold, outside of the solar system, which is cool. That's stuff that, as a guy who's interested in space, I just, I'm really interested in that. I want to know what it's what it's like outside of our solar system because we already we don't know very much about what's in our solar system you imagine the difference is again i mentioned it last week the james webb space telescope and the deep field picture has a billion galaxies in a picture that is essentially the size of a grain of sand if you hold it up to the light can you imagine the things that are out there that we don't know and that we don't understand and again, the possibility of life outside of what we already know. And that's really cool. So how does this refueling system change our reach of the cosmos? Night and day. Okay, Being able to refuel out within the solar system off the planet, not on, not on a launch pad, that changes everything in my opinion. Like they said, it makes it so much easier to get to Mars, right? Because you, you spend a lot of fuel to get just out of our out of our gravitational hold. So you're spending a lot of fuel and then you get out there. Guess what? There's more fuel. What? There is more fuel. And if there is more fuel, we can go farther. And if we go farther, there's always farther to go. We can go places like, I mean, I know I'm going to talk about this in a future cast, but um, the ESA, the European Space Agency, just launched the JUICE mission. That's going to Jupiter. They're going to look at like the icy moons of Europa, there could be life there. Europa is, at least from the surface, solid ice. And ice is water, and water is life. We can find a lot of stuff if we can have the fuel and the reach to go further. And that would be absolutely incredible. Okay, Just to be able to see outside of our own reach and outside of our own backyard, incredible. Let's talk about Starbase, okay? Because Starbase, yeah, Starbase is a thing, right? It's a, it's its own monster. So, back in the day, they built a, uh, a facility in California where they were going to essentially manufacture Starship. Um, SpaceX eventually ended up actually destroying that and tearing it all apart. And essentially what looked like decommissioned their mission. Okay. And then they moved to Texas. So I'm going to give you the quote from SpaceX on Starship Base. Okay. 
Development and manufacturing of Starship takes place at Starbase, one of the world's first commercial spaceports designed for orbital missions. Located in Cameron County, Texas, near the Gulf of Mexico, Starbase is one of four active launch sites in the United States operated by SpaceX. It is the first optimized for Starship, which can transport satellites, payloads, crews, and cargo to a variety of orbits and Earth, lunar, and Martian landing sites. End quote. So, this place has been specifically designed for the for the scale of of Starship. Uh, it's really it's in Boca Chica, Texas. Um, it's literally a hop, skip, and a jump from the border of uh, the United States and Mexico. As a matter of fact, during the launch window for Starship on Monday. You could see the the like border patrol blimp patrolling uh, just south of Boca Chica. Um, I know the uh, NASA spaceflight crew commented on it too because I mean we're supposed to have clear airspace, and as they started to get close to scrubbing, you could see a little bit more going on. But uh, the blimp was out of the the flight zone anyway. But yeah, they were commenting on just seeing it or whatever because you could see it on the live telecast. Um. So since 2020, SpaceX has performed multiple suborbital tests, flights of Starship from Starbase. These tests successfully demonstrated an unprecedented approach to controlled flight, during which the vehicle orients itself for a controlled aerodynamic descent, belly first like a skydiver, accomplished by independent movement of two forward and two aft flaps on the Starship before lighting engines, flipping itself vertical, and landing. So that's another quote from the website. Um, it ends with, uh, this enables <laughs> missions to destinations across the solar system where runways don't exist. So it's just their landing technique makes it so it can vertically land and take back off is essentially what the premise is. Um, let's see. Yeah, here we go. In 2021, SpaceX broke ground uh, on the launch and catch tower at Starbase. The tower rises 480 feet in height, the tallest launch tower in the world, and is designed to support launch vehicle integration and catch of the super heavy rocket booster. Catching the booster reduces mass from the launch vehicle, uh, moves hardware complexity to the ground, and enables rapid reuse of the rocket. So like I said, this literally, they're saying that this is designed to lighten the load a little bit. You don't have to have as much fuel and stuff like that. And then when you catch it on the ground, they can plant it and put another starship on and go again. Just again, the scale, like their, their plan is essentially, in my opinion, to have rapid launches, to be able to do things on such a very quick like schematic. It'll just be unprecedented, I think, at this point through space travel because i remember when when we were doing shuttle launches and stuff like that it was always weeks and weeks in between if at all and a lot of times there were long gaps in between shuttle launches shuttle launches were also such a huge deal they were fully televised and uh, they always had crew and i mean like i said in the last video there were accidents with with the shuttle that you saw on live TV, and I mean, honestly, you can still find them on, on YouTube and stuff like that. The the Challenger explosion is a is a click away on YouTube. Um, you know, SpaceX has been pretty successful at not destroying their stuff, and when they are destroying their stuff, it's uh it's in a controlled environment with uh, people out of the area, which is which is really good. Uh, Elon is eccentric, is the word that I will use, but safety is definitely of priority to him and i know that he over exaggerated in a specific quote but he did say before he puts humans into starship he wants to have thousands of successful launches thousands is probably an, an overreaction i think that he doesn't actually mean that i think he just means he wants a bunch of of successful starship orbital flights um which good he should absolutely want that. And you should absolutely do that. And uh, the more safe we can get that thing, the further out into the cosmos we can go and uh, and come back. So that's that's obviously the end goal, right? People like going to space, but people like coming home. So um, the last quote I will give you from the website says, uh, 
The tower's two gigantic robotic arms lift and stack Starship onto Super Heavy for final integration ahead of flight. Following liftoff and after the two stages separate in flight, Super Heavy will return to the launch site, reignite its engines to slow the vehicle down, and the tower's arms will catch the rocket booster before restacking it on the orbital launch mount for its next flight. Again, again, just talking about the speed at which they want to continue to to launch rockets. And like I said last week, they're already launching them at such a fast pace. Like, there was a period in time for me, especially when I was working full-time, that catching rocket launches was, was rocket science, literally. Like, they would be launching two and three a day from different places, and sometimes two and three times a week, they'd be all over the place. They would be launching a ton. Um, this week alone, the original plan, and I think they'll still successfully do it if if Starship launches Thursday, but they were going to have a Falcon 9 launch for a Starlink satellite. They have a customer payload for Falcon Heavy, and they have the Starship Orbital test flight. If they do all three of those, they will have launched all three of their rocket types in one week. That's incredible. They... The, the teamwork that has to go into this process is is ridiculous. The amount of bodies you have to have in a lot of different places. Because, like I said, the Starship is going to launch from Boca Chica, Texas. Uh, Cape Canaveral is still where they do the, the Falcon 9s. And I'm pretty sure I heard that the Falcon Heavy was going to go from Vandenberg in, in Cali. So you're all over the place. You're absolutely all over the place. Lots of, of manpower. Lots of teamwork. And for all of those to be successful. Successful is going to be kind of a, a, a an ambiguous word this time. Because Starship, there's really not a ton of success. For, like They want this thing to clear the pad, right? Because if it explodes on the pad, the pad is in the center of Starship Complex. There's a lot of damage and they destroy, I think, I, I can't remember the words that Elon used, but level zero, something like that. Uh, the, the main ground. You don't want to destroy all your building technology. So they got to clear the pad. They got to get out of there. Then they want that thing to go up through max Q. And I said it last week. Max Q is the point of maximum stress on the vehicle. Okay. So they want to get this thing through max Q without it blowing up. Then they want to get to stage separation. And if all of that goes good, you can probably mark this as a full blown success. Honestly, if they clear the pad, you'll probably get somebody from SpaceX saying that there was some positives that came out of this. But if you get all the way through stage separation, you could probably say, check, this was a success. Follow that up with the solid, the, the super heavy booster is going to fall into the Gulf of Mexico after stage separation. And then Starship is going to make three quarters of an orbit and it's going to spelly flop essentially somewhere near Hawaii. If all of that happens with no environmental damage, with no loss of life or injury, stuff like this is going to be a full-blown success. But that doesn't sound like the success that space normally has to offer, right? Because we're not talking we're going out. We're just just running a test lap. It's like uh, a lot of you probably don't watch NASCAR, but it's like NASCAR, right? These are just pace laps. We're just testing. We're just doing some laps. We're making sure that we get this thing right so that when we do the big, the big go... We're positive that this thing is going to be absolutely ready to go. Now, on top of that, NASA has also announced, and I'm going to read you uh, a quote from the NASA website as well, but NASA has also said that in 2025 for the Artemis 3 mission, they are going to team up with SpaceX as well. Uh, this mission will return humanity to the moon through the use of combined engineering techniques, and, and the two companies... Uh, want to safely obviously land on the lunar surface and then return to space again before returning home. Um, uh, NASA's website highlights the relationship uh, between the two companies by saying, NASA has selected SpaceX to provide the human landing system that will transport Artemis 3 astronauts from Orion in lunar orbit to the surface of the moon and back again. SpaceX plans to use a unique concept of operation to increase the overall efficiency of the lander. After a series of tests, SpaceX will fly at least one uncrewed demo mission that lands Starship on the lunar surface. When Starship has met all of NASA's requirements and high standards for crew safety, it will be ready for the first Artemis mission. 
Before the crew launch, SpaceX will launch a storage depot to Earth orbit. A series of reusable tankers will carry propellant to the storage depot uh, to fuel the human landing system. The uncrewed star, uh, Starship landing system will then launch to Earth orbit and rendezvous with the storage depot to fill its tanks before executing a translunar injection burn and traveling approximately six days to NRHO, near Renticular Halo Orbit, uh, where it will await the Artemis Three crew. When both spaceship when both spacecraft have arrived in the NRHO, Orion will dock with Starship with the Starship human landing system in preparation for the first lunar surface expedition of the 21st century. One of the crew and their supplies once the crew and the supplies are ready, two astronauts will board Starship and two will remain on Orion. Uh, Orion will undock and back away from Starship and remain in the NRHO for roughly one orbit around the moon lasting about six and a half days. They will, this will match the length of the surface expedition, so as Orion completes its orbit, the two-person surface crew will finish their work on the surface in time to launch back up and meet the spacecraft. So this is all very timed, very thoroughly timed process, um, designed, like, I said, like they just said, to they're going to be on the surface long enough for the Orion craft to do an orbit, and then they'll rendezvous back up and head home. Um, the Artemis mission is, I said it in last week's video, it's, it's our return to the moon. It's, it's our, the, one of the biggest step we've made as humans outside of this planet in a very, very, very long time. So I know those of us interested in space are, are waiting, are, are really excited for the Artemis mission. Um, I, I definitely have admired a lot of SpaceX's work in recent years. A Starship, if it's if it's successful, is going to be an absolutely incredible feat in of of strength of ingenuity in the space community. So I'm very excited, and to see Starship, if Starship works successfully, and then Starship is going to be a piece of the Artemis crew launch, it's going to be incredible. And what what teamwork! Back in the day, I you know I only ever remember NASA launching things. NASA was who sent things out, um, at least publicly, most of the time. Like I said, televised and all that stuff. NASA did all that. So now for NASA and and some and a team with the experience that SpaceX has right now, launching things into orbit, for those two to team up for this huge mission is incredible. And honestly, I can't wait. 2025, I can't wait for that to happen. And 2024, just for the uh, the lunar orbit mission, is going to be incredible. Uh, can't wait for, for Starship and for Artemis, for that matter. Um, you know, Starship will be the world's most powerful rocket ever built. Um, and with these systems that I had previously mentioned uh, that are incorporated into Starship, uh, SpaceX is going to be able to take crew and cargo far, far beyond the reach of Earth's gravitational hold. And then you add in the power and experience that NASA has, and there may truly be no limits to how far we can go outside of Earth and how much knowledge we can gain about the cosmos. So I'll ask a question because I know that it's going to be on somebody's mind. You know, why Mars? Okay, I've, I've heard it a ton. Um, I've heard a lot of arguments about... Mars and whether or not we need to be there. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, so humanity has always wondered about Mars, right? And, and whether or not we could ever go there or can we live there? Um, and there's a lot we don't know about Mars. However, I, th I feel there's a confidence in the scientific community um, that we have a chance to discover life maybe on the Martian surface and, and a lot of other things. There's evidence of frozen polar ice caps, which, again, water is the ingredient needed to foster life. There is the solar system's largest volcano is on Mars. And it's still active. And activity means it has an active core. And these things are all things that I feel are positive when we're talking about possible habitability and maybe even the possibility of us making it habitable. Um, but currently... It, it's not habitable to us. The atmosphere is made mostly of carbon dioxide. Um, the terrain, it's rough. It's dry. It's, I mean, the movie The Martian, I think, shows it good, but you can obviously look at Perseverance. You know, 
pictures from the rover have it's it's desolate you know it's it's rough out there um but we do currently like i just said we have we have an arsenal of technology on the martian surface to learn about that environment and see if we can find ways of making it habitable to us um we got rovers we got curiosity and perseverance out there they roam they they look for signs of life they're collecting environmental samples of the air of the soil of rocks um so that we can learn what makes mars you know what 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 is mars what's on the surface what nutrients are there what what's in the dirt all this kind of stuff right um perseverance also holds two other instruments it has moxie moxie is an instrument that tests technology that could uh turn martian carbon dioxide into oxygen which obviously we would need in order to be there at least without constant space suit use like matt damon in the martian okay um, the other thing it has is the Ingenuity helicopter. Ingenuity is designed to test powered flight in the Martian atmosphere. Can we fly there? What can we do with the gravity on Mars? This always leads to the concept of terraforming, right? Scientists always talk about terraforming Mars. People who don't know a ton about space, like me, talk about terraforming Mars. Can we create a, an environment that is sustainable for human life? on mars obviously we haven't ever had a human on mars so we don't have a ton of of ground information from us about how mars is for humans um and honestly i've heard through the community and you can listen to like star talk podcast with neil degrasse tyson stuff like that the technology isn't all there yet for for terraforming perhaps once we get there once we get to mars we probably have a shot at figuring out just what we can do on Mars, right? But I mean, once we get there, we once we learn, then we can make dreams realities and stuff like. Because the community, like I said, they always talk about terraforming Mars. What I'm going to say is, this is where the question comes up, and I say question. It's more of a debate. I've seen it posed as an argument, but what people keep asking. Why go to space and why go to Mars when there is so much wrong here on Earth? Okay. Now, there are two sides to every story. And I see both sides. I'm going to start it with that. I see both sides. Okay. But one, I agree. There are things we need to work on here on Earth. Okay. We have a damaged atmosphere for sure. Climate change has become more and more evident throughout the years, no matter how much Specific groups of people want to fight that climate change does not exist. Climate change has existed forever. The Earth goes through cycles. It is very cyclical. It gets hot. It gets cold. It gets hot. It gets cold. Look at any and all prehistoric documentation, all that kind of stuff, all the research. We go through cycles. Ice ages, droughts, ice ages, droughts. We've done it. We've been there. We've done it. Okay. The climate changes. We all need to get past that. Okay. It does. We haven't helped. Okay, the climate was changing rapidly when carbon dioxide was just something emitted by natural environment. And now we're pumping tons of greenhouse fuels and stuff into the atmosphere. We are messing it up too. It's a team effort. Us and Earth have teamed up on Earth. That's really what's happened here. There are a lot of solutions to climate change and to a lot of the other environmental-based issues that we have. Unfortunately, those issues end up in the political battle arena. They essentially put these ideas to fix it on battle rhinos, and they send them in there to fight to the death. They don't really do that, obviously. But you know what I'm saying. They send these things into Congress and stuff like that. It never goes exactly the way that any climatologist or professional would want it to. And then it falls to the wayside, and we wonder why things on earth are not going the way we want them to go however let's think about mars right i i personally view mars as a dream as a fantasy right it is an untouched frontier in our own backyard it is an end goal many are going to say if we can trans if we can terraform that planet why can't we just do it here why can't we just fix it here I just gave, I think, fairly good reasons why, right? 
it all ends up political. It all ends up in the hands of people who don't know. But what I'm going to tell you to do is just wait, wait for a clear night and just go outside with the naked eye, with binoculars, with telescopes, whatever, and just look up. There is so much we don't know about what is out there. And there's no better way to learn about the stars and about the planets and about the galaxies and the cosmos than to just be among them. Not everybody has to go. Okay? So for those of you who are worried or who think it's stupid to go to space, I'm going to say this very nicely. You don't have to go. It's going to be okay. Let the dreamers dream. Let the people who want to be here be here. That is completely fine. What I would say is that if somebody called me tomorrow from NASA, from SpaceX, whatever, and said, hey, man, we have an opportunity to send you to space. You, a guy who has no experience and no training, we're going to send you to space. Do you want to go? The answer is yes. And the reason the answer is yes is because that may be the only opportunity I ever get to do so. A lot of astronauts don't get to go a ton of times, okay? And someone like me, who has no reason to go to space, aside from sheer curiosity, I would hands down go, accept the risk and go, right? No risk without reward or no reward without risk. And, and it's just an opportunity that few get. If you pass it up, there may come a time when you're like, man, should I have gone? Should I have taken the chance and seen what's out there? Think about it like uh, Will Smith and Independence Day, right? When he's driving the UFO and they go, they go out of the, the hangar at Area 51 and he shoots it off into space. And the second he gets through the atmosphere and it's just stars and darkness and it's, he's in space. He's finally there after all the time he's wanted to go. And all he says is, I've been waiting for this opportunity my whole life. Like, that's... If you have dreams and you finally get to touch those dreams, it's incredible. So, what I'm going to say is, if you're not a space person, let the space people have their dreams, man. Because not all of us are going to get to do it. Not all of us are going to get to touch it. Not all of us are going to get to see it. Just let them dream, man. You, Nobody needs to tell other people that they can't live their dreams. And there will be episodes where we're going to talk about stuff like that, for sure. There is no reason other people can't dream, okay? Treat other people how you want to be treated. And uh, if you have dreams and you want to be successful and have those dreams... Let other people dream. The next question I guess we'll talk about is when, right? When when is Mars realistic? Okay. So Elon's timetable has adjusted through time at this point. <laughs> On and off, over and over. He's moved it around. He's done a bunch of stuff. But when he bought Twitter, he said his earliest guess for humans on Mars was 2029. Now... If he's going to try to test Starship a thousand times, that's obviously not going to happen, I don't think. Um, I think the in the scientific community, as far as I've read, most of us, myself included, would be happy with 2040 being, being a Mars year or whatever. Don't rush, right? Because we want to test this technology. We want to get humans there. And most importantly, we want to get them back. Because I remember when they first started talking about a Mars mission, I think SpaceX was talking about a Mars mission years ago, that was a one-way trip. You could sign up to go. It was one way. You were going to go to Mars. But then you weren't going to come back. You were stuck there because they had no return system, no no RTLS, none of that stuff. They were Once you went, you were stuck. And I remember seeing like petitions and stuff that had hundreds of thousands of signatures on it for people willing to go to Mars and die for the cause. Now I think we've finally gotten past that, right? Because now we're figuring out how to land these rockets, how to relaunch these rockets. I mean, I literally just told you about how Starship can reland and restack and relaunch. Like, that's the whole premise, right? So hopefully, if we give it time, 2040 seems like a good, good end goal, right? For the first time to go. <clears throat> if you give it enough time, 
maybe we won't have any accidents or anything too ridiculous. You know, we can go, we can look, we can grab some stuff and we can leave. And we can come back and we can learn about it. And then when we go the next time, we know more. And then we do it again. And we do it again. And we do it again. And the more we do it, the more we know. And the more experience we have. And it pays out in the end. Especially if you're talking about things like possibly terraforming. The more you know, the more successful I think we can be scientifically on the surface of another planet. Alright guys. So I think that's going to wrap this episode for today let's just briefly kind of run down what we had talked about right we talked about um starship scrubbing on monday tune in on uh, on thursday guys check me out on tiktok uh we're gonna be i'm gonna be talking about starship i'll be up for the live coverage posting some videos and stuff like that um and then if we get a successful launch i don't know if i'll do another video this week it's possible but uh if we get a successful launch next week there will definitely be some star starship talk uh, on next week's uh, Introverse Uncharted podcast, for sure. Um, you know, we talked about what made Star, you know, how SpaceX designed Starship and and what the premise of all of their pieces are. We talked about NASA and SpaceX teaming up for Artemis. It's going to be incredible. It's going to be an absolute feat of ingenuity. We talked about why Mars. Now, what I can tell you is there is definitely going to be a future podcast just about Mars. There's also going to be one about Venus because these are two places that are close to us that we can see with the naked eye in our sky that people like me have always wondered about. So we're going to talk about those in future podcasts. But just for today, we talked about just the premise of why we should go there, why maybe we shouldn't go there, you know, the pros and the cons and stuff like that, and why we should consider our own planet and stuff like that. And then, of course, we talked about when. Hopefully... Before I die, we will have gone to Mars. But 2040 sounds really nice. So hopefully, that's where we're going to be at. Um, as always, I'm going to end this with uh, with a quote of the day, right? Quote of the day is going to be... Uh, it's going to be cliche, obviously. It's going to be because you know me, right? Uh, so I'm going to go with a quote by Neil deGrasse Tyson. It's going to be, Space exploration is a force unto itself that no other force in society can rival. So that'll just leave you with something to think about, right? That is going to do it, you guys, for today's episode. I want to thank you guys for tuning in again this week. If you liked the episode, please like, follow, share, subscribe, smash that like button, do a lot of stuff. Let's let's get this out in the airwaves. Let's out in the radio waves. I want to be able to get this podcast to the moon whenever they uh whenever they get there you know they want to listen to little old me's voice here in uh in colorado let's let's get this through the airwaves and out there if it goes far you know radio waves never stop maybe some aliens can listen i don't know whatever like follow subscribe share check me out on all of the other social media platforms again tiktok uh instagram facebook i've been doing a lot of stuff on uh, on social media lately guys for the show so let's let's check those out as well um i really just want to thank you guys for taking the time though uh to tune in and to check out all those other places uh, i really enjoy having this project and, and doing this again there will be other content there will be other non-space related content to come in the future so uh if you're not always into space then uh i'm sure what's coming up because we're going to talk like I said, sports and stuff like that down the road too. So let's let's get to uh, some other stuff as well. But down the road, uh, it's going to be really fun. And I really am grateful for you guys tuning in and giving me the opportunity to, to talk to you guys about the stuff that I'm passionate about. And hopefully as time goes by, maybe you'll be passionate with me about them, okay? As always, guys, I ask you to do more than simply exist and come with me into the introverse. Thanks, guys. <laughs>